In this video, I'm gonna take you through my technique that I use to get the right answer on a practice question, even if I don't know what knowledge is required to actually answer the question. Hey friends, this is the second video in our series showing you how you can improve your UWorld scores. You can check out the first video in the series here and I'm gonna take you through a practice question. We're gonna solve it together and I'm gonna show you exactly what I do step by step so you could approach practice questions yourself and hopefully get the question right. By the way, if you're new here, my name's Chris. I'm now an international medical graduate and I make videos about my IMG journey. So let's read the question together. Okay, so we have a four-year-old male infant that was brought to the pediatrician by his mother who is concerned about his white eye. The patient was born at 38 weeks gestation following an uncomplicated pregnancy. The patient's mother denies family history of ocular abnormalities, genetic diseases, or cancer. Physical exam finding is shown in the attached image, so hopefully you can appreciate this image here. The patient has a, a white a pupil. The gene implicated in the pathogenesis of this patient's condition encodes for a protein with which are the following functions. Your first instinct when you see a question that's really intimidating is to just say, uh, there's no way I can answer this, I don't know, and then pick a random answer and then move on. But try and resist the urge to do that. I would advise you to take a step back, stay calm, and just say to yourself, that's okay, let's work with what we do know and try and find the right answer. So if you guys remember, step one is to read the question and highlight the most important information to get the answer. So immediately what stands out to me, I like to highlight the age. I used the gender is typically important and they're presenting with a white eye. Everything else seems normal. Typically I don't highlight things that are normal. And the question is asking for the gene does what following function? So we're looking for the function. So it's really important that we've highlighted the most important parts of the question, because when I go back and look at this now, I'm immediately focusing on four-year-old male with white eye and we're looking for the function of that G. So step two is we have to think to ourselves, what concept is this question testing us on that we have to th start thinking about in terms of the answer? And as we identified here, we're looking for the function of the gene that's implicated in this patient's condition. And, you know, the first step to answering this question is to appreciate the patient's eye and to know that the most common cause of a white eye like this is typically, in practice questions, is typically retinoblastoma. So if you don't have that knowledge, that's okay. It's quite a common practice scenario on exams, so I'd say definitely be familiar with this. You can't go into this with no knowledge, but you know, you don't have to memorize specific things, and I'll show you that later. So this, know that this is retinoblastoma. And the question is talking about a gene and it's talking about a protein and the function of that gene. So let's read the answer choices and see if we can find out a little bit more about the answer. So A, activation of cyclin-dependent kinases, binding an inhibition of E2F, inhibition of the G2M progression, inhibition of apoptosis, and stimulation of growth and proliferation. So you guys might be able to appreciate, but these are all functions to do with the cell cycle, and they're all to do with cancer and things that can go wrong in the cell cycle. So a little bit of content knowledge. You guys may have heard of tumor suppressors and oncogenes. So you do have to have that conceptual knowledge. So if you understand, okay, that a tumor suppressor is something that regulates the cell cycle and prevents you from developing cancer. That's about all you need to know. Proto-oncogene is something that can turn into an oncogene and drive cancer formation. So those are two pieces of conceptual information that you can use to help you answer this question. And also it might be useful to know, this is quite common knowledge, that the two most common tumor suppressors are actually retinoblastoma. RB and P53. So hopefully by using that little bit amount of knowledge, we can answer this question. So step three is to start eliminating the answers that we are absolutely sure it cannot be that one. If there's any of these that we're like so-so, we're not so sure if it could be right or not, then we're gonna leave them for now and then we're gonna come back to them later. So activation of a cyclin-dependent kinase. So if you guys remember from cancer biology, a cyclin-dependent kinase is something that is responsible for moving the cell cycle forward. So hopefully you should be able to eliminate that just based off of that. So we can cross that out. Binding and inhibition of E2F. So, okay, 
Lots of people don't know what E2F is, so let's say you don't know what that is and that's starting to confuse you. If you don't know what it is, leave it alone for now and we'll come back to it later. Inhibition of G2M progression. Okay, we're not so sure about that, but the gene would be inhibiting G2M progression. Now, if you guys remember, if you're inhibiting the progression of the cell cycle, that is actually going to stop cancer formation. So it makes sense for a tumor suppressor to have that function. So I'm gonna leave it for now. And D is inhibition of apoptosis. So inhibition of apoptosis, tumor suppressor is actually responsible for causing apoptosis. If you were inhibiting apoptosis, you would actually be driving cancer, you'd be causing cancer. So a tumor suppressor wouldn't inhibit apoptosis. Okay, so we can rule that one out. And then we've got stimulation of growth and proliferation. So again, this is actually the same answer as D, just in different words. Growth and proliferation are both things that cancer do, which is just general knowledge. So a tumor suppressor would not cause growth and proliferation because we're trying to stop cancer growth. So we're trying to stop proliferation of cells. So hopefully you can appreciate that just based off of conceptual understanding, we've really improved our chances of answering this question just by not giving up. So that's why it's so important when you start these questions, just take a step back and go, okay, I'm a little bit scared right now, but I think we can just give it a good go. So now we're actually down to a 50-50, which is much better odds than a one in five. So next we've got to try and justify if it's either B or C. So the next step is going to require a little bit more knowledge, but let's try and work it out together. So you guys might remember that the two most important cell cycles, checkpoints in the cell cycle, are the G1S checkpoint and the G2M checkpoint. And like we discussed earlier, the tumor suppressors are actually what are responsible for regulating that checkpoint. And actually, most commonly, they're gonna regulate the most important checkpoint. So if you think about it, we need to have tumor suppressors that are gonna work on the more important checkpoint in the cell cycle. Because, you know, if tumor suppressors are so important for regulating the cell cycle, then surely they would work on the most important checkpoint in the cell cycle. So we have the G1S checkpoint and the G2M checkpoint. So the G1S checkpoint is actually the first checkpoint. So that's the one where the cell decides whether or not he's actually going to go and divide. So it's the first checkpoint, it's the most important one because it's the decision stage for every single cell that's going to divide. The second checkpoint is actually the G2M checkpoint. Now, all of the cells that get to this stage have already decided that they're going to divide. So, you know, I like to think about it like this is a less important checkpoint because every cell that's reached this stage has already made the decision to divide. So if we lost that checkpoint, let's say if you had a mutation, then you wouldn't immediately develop cancer because it's a less important checkpoint. So based on that knowledge, this is how I remember that P53 and retinoblastoma protein both act on the G1S checkpoint as opposed to the other one because this one is the more important checkpoint. So based on that information, I don't want to memorize that, okay? It's more important that I have an understanding uh, of the cell cycle and an understanding of where retinoblastoma acts. And just based off of that, I can rule out one of these answers because it says here that you have inhibition of G2M progression. So if you are inhibiting progression of the cell cycle, then that is gonna prevent replication. So yes, it is a tumor suppressor, but as we said, retinoblastoma is gonna work on the first checkpoint because it's the more important checkpoint. I don't know that because of memorization. I know that because of a conceptual understanding. So that just leaves you with choice B. So based off of a, an educated guess, I can select B and uh, hopefully we can get the correct answer. And in this case, this is the right answer, even without understanding what E2F is. So, you know, there are gonna be two different people who get this answer correct. There are gonna be people that have memorized the entire cell cycle and they know every single little detail. Or there are gonna be the other category of people who just have really good exam technique. So this is something that you can implement and it's much better to have understanding as opposed to memorization. I always say this when I'm teaching people how to use Anki. People tend to use Anki to memorize, but with every card you have to apply the Feynman technique which is if you can explain a concept to a five-year-old, then you understand it. So understanding is always superior to memorization. So 
try and understand the topics as you're studying them and create what I call memory anchors, which are little facts of information that you can use to memorize big complex topics. And uh, that's much more efficient than memorizing the whole complement cascade, let's say everything, just through repetition. It takes a lot more time, it's much more, much less efficient. So now that we have our right answer, how do we actually learn from this practice question so we can get the correct answer on exam day? So let's have a look. If you guys remember from the previous video, my two-step method for learning from practice questions, the first one is understanding what went wrong with the practice question. And the next step is actually reviewing and re-reviewing that content moving forward. And it's actually implementing what I call the spiral learning method, which if you remember, it's the continuous process of doing more practice questions, looping back to re-review the material by reading in first aid, as well as doing your Anki cards and continuously doing more and more practice questions. It's less of a focus on writing notes on the specific things that you get wrong, and there's more of a focus on pushing forward and doing as many practice questions as physically possible. And then when you get stuff wrong, you look back and you re-review the stuff that you got wrong. And this process of reviewing and re-reviewing means that you are spending your time studying the most high yield material and that high yield material sticks in your brain the longest. So. Stick with me and let's review this question. Right, so in the first step is understanding and there's three parts to this. It's really important that we understand what happened here. Did we get the question right for the right reason? In this case, it was a process of elimination. So it's important we take note of that and think, okay, can I learn from this question and learn what E2F is? So I will get this question right in the future. And we also wanna look at the incorrect answers. Did I eliminate A for the right reason? Do I actually know what a CDK is? If I did, then that's great. But if I didn't, then that's an alarm. So based off of this, I need to, I know where I stand. And using the spiral learning technique, I can go back and study the topic that I got wrong. Now, really important note here. It's really important that you resist the temptation to go and uh, do lots and lots of reading on biochemistry because you got this question wrong. In this case, you want to go back and study specifically the content that you got wrong in this question. So in this case, it's the cell cycle. So I would go back and I would study, look at E2F, I would look at CDKs, and I would look at the, all of the different, you know, I would revise what a tumor suppressor is, what the checkpoints are, and just resist the urge to go overboard and read like the whole biochemistry chapter, just because you got one question wrong. The spiral learning technique really focuses on reviewing and re-reviewing new material. So you can't spend too much time going back and reading the books. So now that we've kind of understood where we're at, we have to kind of think, okay, what else went wrong with this question? Why did we get this question wrong? Was it a knowledge issue? Was it a issue with question technique, which is quite common? Or was it just a silly mistake? Often it's a combination of one or two of these things. But usually I say just to think about it, just so you, you know, kind of know what went wrong with the question, as opposed to just saying, ah, you know, something went wrong, but I don't really know what went wrong. Try and find out like, Put a pin on it and try and figure out, okay, I think it was because I didn't know what E2F was. And I also, I knew what the other answers were, but I didn't put the effort in to really use my question technique. So that's a common issue. So that would be an example of knowledge and question technique. But now I, you know, if you categorize, you know moving forward what you need to do in the future. And then the final most important thing is to write down a sentence in your notes or in Anki, write down one sentence that would help you get this specific question right again in the future, if you saw this question again. And the way you do that is by looking at the explanations. So in New World, you will answer the question and then they will give you an explanation. So this is an example of an explanation for this question. You can see there's a lot of information. Typically, there will be a few, you know, words in bold that are important, retinoblastoma. They will highlight things that are important for your understanding. So it's important to know that retinoblastoma causes leukocoria and also, uh, you know, strabismus. But this is, a, this is a very long explanation. If you didn't know what retinoblastoma is, then obviously I would go back and read just that section and I would find out what retinoblastoma is and, you know, the common ways it can present. But we really need to try and extract one sentence that will help us get this right in the future. And for me, that sentence is here. RB, which is the gene product of RB, functions to bind to E2F, which is a transcription factor. So a transcription factor, using our conceptual understanding, that would be something that pushes the cell cycle forward and prevents transcription 
which makes sense, of genes necessary for G1S progression. So that sentence is so full of knowledge and understanding. If you can conceptually understand and memorize this sentence, you really understand the whole picture. So you don't need to go away and you know read the entire biochemistry section and take notes on the entire cell cycle. No, you just need to look at this sentence. If you understand this sentence, you can answer the question and you can answer any question like this in the future, okay? So what I would do is I would literally take this sentence and I would copy it. And typically what I would do is I would go to my Anki. So this is my Anki. And what I would do is I would go and I would press browser and I would literally just type retinoblastoma. And what I would do is I would, any specific concepts that I didn't really know before, let's say I didn't know that it caused a white reflex, I would unsuspend that card. Or let's say I didn't know um, that it causes, let's find something. So if I didn't know that it causes a white reflex, then I would unsuspend that card. I would also add a tag to this card. Because we got the question incorrect, we need to add it to our incorrect filter deck. So I would select the card and you can do control shift A, uh, or you can just right click and select add tags. And then I would do my incorrect tag, which for me it's percent missed questions underscore set two. So I would add uh, that tag to those cards. And then when I rebuild my filtered deck for my incorrects, you know, uh, it would come up as um, in my filtered deck. For me, my incorrects deck is called missed questions. And as you can see, uh, it takes everything that has the missed cues card uh, and it builds a deck based off of that. So I'll be able to review just the incorrect cards. If I wasn't able to find uh, a really nice card on retinoblastoma, I would actually create a new card and you can do that by clicking add and then I can just paste in the fact that I just read uh, and at that point I can just create a card with a closed deletion for E2F which is a transcription factor which transcripts the genes necessary for G1S. Now this is okay but you have to remember that this isn't going to help you in the long term, you really have to focus on understanding over memorization. And some people tend to focus too much on memorization. Now, this is gonna help you with memorization, um, but typically you need a little bit of both, okay? So this helps you with the memorization side of things. You know, you can't succeed only on understanding. There are some facts that you need to memorize. What you could also do is take this sentence and kind of write it down in a notebook. And uh, I knew someone who had a whole notebook and it was just sentences of high yield material. Uh, that was specific to them and uh, they took this notebook around with them everywhere they went and whenever they had a spare moment you know on the toilet they would just whip out the notebook and and read through the highlighted material which is all the incorrects so it was a very high yield source of information and it's okay because you're utilizing the spaced repetition which is a very effective and evidence-based uh, study method, as opposed to just writing notes. Notes, writing notes themselves isn't the best way to study. It's not that evidence-based. We have better ways of studying, like active recall. But, you know, if you're gonna use something and you like writing notes, then you can do that because you're activating the spaced repetition, which is evidence-based. Okay. So that's all the really important information I wanted to cover. And if you guys want to support the channel, you can now buy me a coffee down below. It's kind of a service where you can send me a once-off coffee to support my crippling coffee addiction. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Peace.